Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the second part of the lecture where we talk more about um, some specific peculiarities of how glaciers flow in Antarctica, like what happens when glaciers flow to the sea, as well as how some parts of glaciers will flow faster than others in the form of ice streams, as well as how a network of glaciers, a network of subglacial lakes exist. Most of this lecture will, however, relate to what happens to glaciers when they reach the ocean. But one topic I did want to touch upon was the existence of subglacial lakes. And we have touched on subglacial lakes previously. We've mentioned, I've mentioned Lake Vostok, which um, is a subglacial lake located under, well, its Vostok station is built over where the subglacial lake is. And remember that Vostok Station is where the coldest temperatures on Earth were ever recorded. And it's in the interior of the continent where the ice is very thick. And where the ice is very thick, the pressure from that overlying ice actually allows for a small amount of meltwater to exist at the bottom. Um, higher pressure actually makes it easier to melt ice. So in a number of places, the, the pressure from the thick ice, and in some cases combined with heat from geothermal processes, like heat from a hot spot, that allows for meltwater to form lakes at the underneath these glaciers. Subglacial means these lakes are underneath the glaciers. And it turns out that the water actually flows between the lakes to some extent in the form of rivers. You have some, you do have some lakes that are more isolated than others, and they'll experience differing amounts of flow between them depending on the temperature throughout the year or depending on conditions year to year. But the interesting thing about Lake Vostok is that there's actually enough meltwater there that it is the world's sixth largest lake by volume. And that is between Lake Malawi, which is one of the African Great Lakes along the Great Rift Valley. Um, so it's actually it's between Lake Malawi and Lake Michigan. So the seventh largest lake in the world by volume is Lake Michigan. So actually there is more water in Lake Vostok than there is in Lake Michigan, which is kind of amazing. But for the most part, the movement of water related to glaciers doesn't happen via liquid water at the base. It happens via the glaciers themselves, the glaciers themselves, which consist of solid water that actually moves. And the glaciers themselves, even though they're solid, they move very slowly, kind of like the asthenosphere. They experience a slow process of deforming and reshaping, kind of similar to what happens with the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is solid, but it can flow and deform like butter or soft plastic. And one thing that's really interesting actually is that within ice sheets, you can actually spot noticeable currents the same way that you have currents in an ocean. There are parts of the glacier that are going to move fastest, faster than others. And these are known as ice streams. And one thing to consider is that often the ice streams are located kind of in the middle of a glacier. The areas where the glacier, where the glacier are moving fastest are in the middle. And why is that? Well, consider friction. A glacier is going to have a lot of friction where it's coming into contact with the rock. It's going to be grinding and crushing that rock. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about how glaciers leave, how, glacier, how glaciers break the rock underneath them down and leave a particular erosion imprint, basically. But the rock surrounding the glaciers causes friction. It slows them down. Now, the parts of the glacier that are going to be slowed down most are the sides, which are going to be in contact with the wall, with the rocks, and the bottom, which is also in contact with the rocks. Sort of the top middle of the glacier, the part that's farthest from any rocks, that flows, far, that flows farthest because it's in contact with other ice and not the surrounding rock. So you often get ice streams in the part of the glacier that's farthest from any rock kind of at the top and in the middle where there's less friction from the surrounding bedrock that is underneath the ice. And looking at West Antarctica, you can see how it's heavily dominated by the flow of ice into the Weddell Sea. Um, ice is converging. Remember that the West Antarctic ice sheet has convergent flow where most of the ice streams are flowing in the same direction. And most of that ice is coming out here in the Rhone ice shelf. And this is a really good example, actually, of how the glaciers in Antarctica don't stop at the ocean. There is enough, even at the coast, the glaciers are often still accumulating, 
so that the glacier kind of feeds over the ocean and the glacier actually extends over the ocean. That's what an ice shelf is, something we'll, that we'll go over later in this part of the lecture. Now, ice can form a stream the same way that liquid water can, or the same way that water can within an ocean. Something else that's really interesting is that glaciers can actually form waterfalls of a sort. When the terrain suddenly becomes steeper, like when a glacier begins to, when a glacier that's often, often the case what happens in the dry valleys is that you have the ice sheet approaching the mountains and then it'll kind of get funneled through this gap and start piling down the slope. And that causes essentially a frozen waterfall, what's known as an ice fall. And it forms from sudden steepness the same way that a liquid waterfall does and it erodes the underlying rock the same way a waterfall does. And notice how full of cracks the ice is in this picture. And that's distortion from the rapid change. Those are crevasses. Crevasses are the cracks in the ice and they form when the ice comes under sudden stress. We'll talk more in, this, in Wednesday's lectures about how glaciers flow differently depending on whether they're suddenly being subjected to stress or whether they're under relatively little low scale broad stress. But if something happens to suddenly disturb a glacier, like the steepness changes all of a sudden, the glacier is going to get really distorted when it flows. It's going to get kind of kind of cracked up, crevassed, crevassed up, if you will. And that's why the ice flowing down ice falls often looks like this. It doesn't look particularly smooth. It's full of cracks. And we'll talk more about the dynamics of how glaciers move and how what causes glaciers to move in different ways during the next class. But I wanted to introduce the concept of ice falls just as a parallel to how glaciers, which are solid water, really do function as the rivers of the Antarctic continent to a big extent, because it's so cold that even it's so cold that there's going to be very, very little available liquid water outside of the oceans. Now, a lot of the glaciers that I've showed you earlier in this part of the lecture and in the first part of the lecture terminated on land. They terminated after ice falls or they terminated as Piedmont glaciers. But glaciers do actually sometimes reach the ocean and this happens quite a bit in Antarctica. And an outlet glacier is any type of glacier that reaches the ocean, any instance where the ice actually gets close to the ocean. One specific type of outlet glacier is a tidewater glacier where the glacier, where the terminus of the glacier is on the ocean itself. It doesn't extend very far out on the ocean, but it, the, it extends far enough so that when it's high tide that causes it to lift up and when it's low tide it causes it to sink down. Now if glaciers flow with enough volume, more than you would find for a tidewater glacier, Instead of stopping over the ocean, the ice actually flows quite a bit far out in the ocean. And that's what makes up the ice shelves. Where you have a lot of volume of ice flowing to the ocean, instead of stopping at the ocean, it will flow on top of the ocean because ice is less dense than liquid water. And you'll actually have a permanent extension of the glacier sticking out over the ocean. And that's the cool thing about ice shelves. They're permanent features. They're not they're attached to the glacier on land. They're not just water that freezes periodically. And that's the difference between sea ice and ice shelves. Sea ice tends to be seasonal and tends to form just from liquid water freezing. The ice shelf is actually that ice that has accumulated inland at the center of the glacier reaching the edge of the ocean. And even in, even in Antarctica, the ice shelves will eventually break down. The, the ocean, being in contact with the glacier causes the glacier to melt. Being in contact with the ocean is fat. So if the ocean is in contact with the ocean, it's going to melt faster than being in contact with the land. The ocean is a better conduit. The water is going to be a better conduit of heat than the rock is. And the liquid water is going to, is going to provide heat that's going to warm the glacier and cause it to melt and start to break up. And calving, which is, I think, kind of ironically named because it's named after cows being born, but it's actually where glaciers end their life in a sense. Calving is when these ice sheets, these ice shelves, excuse me, break up into icebergs at their outer extremes. Sea ice is completely separate from this. Sea ice forms on the surface of the water and it's usually seasonal. There's going to be some sea ice during the summer, but a lot of sea ice is going to form during the winter when it's especially cold. And then 
melt in the summer, which was something I touched upon when I talked about the life cycles of phytoplankton algae in Antarctica, as well as the life cycle of krill. Now let's talk about outlet glaciers. Outlet glaciers are any instance in which the ice reaches the ocean. So tidewater glaciers are just one type of that. The example on the right is the Farrar Glacier, which is an example of a glacier that takes ice, that takes water from the East Antarctic ice sheet, which you can kind of see as this kind of broad expanse of ice in the background of this picture. And then it travels through valleys becoming a valley glacier and eventually flows out to the ocean, taking that, taking that ice with it. And I have another diagram here that actually gives you a sense of what direction the ice is flowing. The ice is going to look motionless to us because it is so slow. But if you trace its movement over the course of a few years, you'll realize it's very, very slowly creeping downhill. And that ice is, in this case, being separated into two separate streams by this mountain here. So the East Antarctic ice sheet ice gets channeled over here, but gets separated into two channels. And then those two channels merge the same way that you might have two rivers merging. And the ice flows through what I guess is a more resistant type of rock through this narrow channel here. And it flows out to the Ross ice shelf. Oops becoming an outflow glacier and with and carrying the ice, carrying the ice from the Eastern Arctic ice sheet all the way to the ice shelf. And really, you have to remember the ice is moving. The ice is excruciatingly slowly moving from the interior of the continent out towards the oceans. And since there's enough massive ice accumulating in Antarctica, and because the coasts are often zones of accumulation as well, you actually have a lot of ice reaching the, reaching the ocean and ending up being pushed floating over the ocean as the ice shelves. Now, if you have glaciers that don't have quite enough mass to extend all the way over the ocean, you'll have what's called a tidewater glacier, where the glacier ends over a bay. And they are called tidewater glaciers because their overall flow of rate, including further back up, is going to be very heavily influenced by the tides. Because at high tide, when the water level lifts up, that's going to cause the end or terminus of the glacier to get a lift from the higher water. And that's actually going to cause the overall glacier farther back to flow a lot faster, or slightly faster at least, because the lift is going to reduce friction with the ground. There's a buoyancy force coming from the water lifting the end of the glacier up. Now, when, high, when low tide comes, when the water drops down a little bit, that buoyancy is lost and the glacier is back to just being all the way down on the ground, grinding against the rock, and it starts to flow more slowly again. So tidewater glaciers are influenced by the tides, and they have also been heavily impacted by global warming because they are, they're kind of small to begin with, especially compared to the glaciers that end in full ice sheets. And I, tidewater glaciers have retreated quite a bit. One of the, one of the lab exercises actually relates to tracing the depletion of a tidewater glacier over time. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's in contact with the ocean, which is warming due to anthropogenic um, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if there is a lot of ice coming out at the edge, then you have an ice shelf. If a glacier doesn't terminate at the ocean, but the ice instead continues to flow over the surface of the ocean, you have an ice shelf, which is literally the over the ocean extension of the ice sheet. and in Antarctica, even at the coast, you have more accumulation of snow than you have melting of snow, ablation. And so the, this is especially true where you have large ice streams converging, like where you have in Western Antarctica, a bunch of ice sheets converging into the Rhone ice shelf. And the ice shelves will be attached to land on one end and at the other end will be an ice cliff, which is where, there's no longer, which is where the influence of the ocean water and the fact that it's far enough away from the accumulation zone means that it's going to start breaking up into icebergs or calving is what it's known as, a term which I briefly introduced before. And the ice shelves are permanent. They are, they are a pretty stable mass, meaning that they don't really change, they're not supposed to change shape very often if the climate is stable. That is not true right now though, because global warming is causing the oceans to heat up enough, especially in West Antarctica, that some alarmingly large pieces of these ice shelves are starting to break off. 
here's a diagram that actually kind of shows the difference between glaciers in Greenland and glaciers in Antarctica in terms of how ice shelves form. So Greenland doesn't really have ice shelves as extensively as Antarctica does. And it's really not quite as cold in Greenland. In Greenland, the glaciers are usually at the ablation or the mostly they're on their way out stage by the time they reach the ocean. There's not enough ice mass that you're going to have a significant mass of ice over the ocean. And so the ice usually breaks off directly at the coast now, in Antarctica, since you have snow still building up at the coast, the ice just keeps going over the ocean. You'll notice how the snow is flowing overall from an exaggerated version of the east of the dome of the East Antarctic ice sheet downward and outward towards the ocean. And what actually finally causes the ice shelf to break up or calve is subglacial melting from the ocean. The ice starts to be broken up underneath from heat from the ocean water, and that will eventually cause it to become unstable and break up. Um, but that's why in Antarctica you have iceberg calving happening farther out at the edge of the ice sheets versus right along the coast, as you do in Greenland. And the large ice shelves in Antarctica cover most of the bays or inlets around the Antarctic coast. So the largest is the rice, is the Ross ice shelf, um, which surrounds Ross Island, which is where Mount Erebus is located, as well as the United States' McMurdo base. The only open water at the coasts is usually going to be where the catabatic winds, which are actually, one thing you'll notice is that they're actually, they're already going fast because of the dome shape of the ice sheet, but at the coast, they are driven even faster because they sink down where the ice is kind of sloping down into the ice sheet. They will actually, that will actually push the sea ice away from the ice sheet and cause an area of open water, and that will cause the formation of more sea ice and thus initiate an Arctic bottom water formation. And those are the polynias, the coastal polynias that I was talking about. Most coastal polynias form between the ice shelf and non-permanent sea ice, where the catabatic winds are flowing down the ice sheet and the ice shelf and pushing the sea ice away. Now, calving is a fancy word for iceberg formation. When glaciers break apart over the ocean, they're said to be calving because they're breaking into tiny pieces. Um, and the ice ceases to be part of the glacier at that point. The ice falls into the ocean and becomes icebergs until it melts. An iceberg is just a term for little bits of ice not really attached to a broader mass of sea ice or to an ice shelf. And the tip of the iceberg term comes from, of course, the fact that only a small portion of the iceberg is going to be above water. Now, Icebergs normally, iceberg formation normally isn't that much of a concern. Eventually the, the ice sheets break off at a certain point, but there have been some alarming breakoffs of large portions of some of the ice shelves recently. And the ice shelves in Western Antarctica have been seeing pieces as large as the states of Rhode Island or Delaware breaking off. And this is not normal behavior. These ice shelves normally don't break off in large chunks like this, but this indicates that even though the shelves are kind of defined as permanent features in a stable climate, the climate is destabilizing. The climate is getting warmer because of what humans are doing. And that's causing the shape of these ice shelves to physically change. They're, they're calving in larger amounts now because this is no longer stable. This is the zone, this is where the, sta this is where the stability stops now as opposed to out here on the right side. This tells you the ice sheets are becoming less stable and breaking apart closer to the edge of the continent. Especially in Western Antarctica, there's there's less ice mass building these ice sheets, these ice shelves, excuse me. Sea ice is not actually the same as glacier formation. Sea ice formation really has nothing to do with glaciers directly. Sea ice forms on the surface of the ocean year round, fringing the land and the ice shelves, but it becomes a lot more expansive during the winter. And it plays a lot of important roles. Remember that sea ice formation is what triggers Antarctic bottom water formation and that it also provides habitat for krill and algae to live in during the, during the winter. It also helps keep Antarctica cold. Sea ice is going to have higher albedo than the darker colored liquid ocean water. And so when Antarctica is covered by a lot of sea ice, especially during the winter, more solar radiation is reflected. And <clears throat> in Antarctica, sea ice is becoming less extensive and more fragile. Sea ice is forming to a much less strong extent this is not a comparison. This is a comparison between between summer and winter. But the winter ice extents are starting to look less like this and horrifyingly more like this. And that's not good. If the ice 
if the if the sea ice cover extensively changes, that's going to affect the formation of Antarctic bottom water, which is going to have consequences for global ocean circulation and climate and ecology. Reduced albedo is going to warm Antarctica up more. And it's already affecting the populations of krill. Something we'll talk more about during the climate change unit is that Antarctic krill are plummeting because sea ice, sea ice is being depleted. On that cherry note, we will continue with glaciers in Wednesday's lecture, where I'll talk more about the mechanisms of glacier movement, as well as what glaciers do to the rocks underlying them, aka how glaciers erode. Until then, and I apologize for putting this out so late. Have a good night.